сейчас по Arturo. People grieve in different ways. I don't know if it's going to get any better, but it's something that I know it's going to stay with me forever. I'm going to miss my son forever. Nobody's going to be able to replace him. And I hope to, to honor him by doing the best in my days I have ahead of me. My name is Arturo Guerra Perez. I am a Mexican citizen, born and raised in Monterey, Mexico. I started flying, I want to say 1990, I started with ultralights. And uh, I did that for a few years. Hey, Arturo was uh, born 1994 in Monterey. He got interested in flying with me I mean, I was, I had a small Cessna at the time, and we went to short trips to the border, to McAllen, to San Antonio. For him, it was natural just to fly with dad and the family. Once, one time he told me, hey dad, why do we have to always fly? Why can't we just drive like the other kids? <laughs> so I said, okay, well, uh, he's getting spoiled. One, th one day I'll, I'll drive him so that he knows the difference. I enrolled him in a high school, in a military academy in uh, Wisconsin. And uh, when he got to the, to the academy the first day, when he was choosing his classes, he told me, hey dad, there's aviation here. Uh, may I join the aviation program? And uh, I said, sure, of course, happy to do it. At the end of the program, he had his check ride. He went for his check ride about, I don't know, it was about six hours long. It was real long. I was waiting for him at the airport. And when he came back, he just gave me the thumbs up and he had passed his check ride. I was so happy and so proud. A weekend of adventure awaited Arturo Jr. and his father as they charted a course from Monterey, Mexico to Burnett, Texas a small but vibrant tourist and aviation town just an hour north of Austin. With around 15 hours already logged in the family's new carbon cub, Arturo Jr.'s goal was to earn his tailwheel endorsement. However, their plans changed on the final day of training when a looming weather front introduced strong winds, prompting his instructor to advise against continuing under adverse conditions. Acknowledging the wisdom in prioritizing safety they decided to cut short their weekend and head back to Mexico. When we were doing the customs uh, in Nuevo Laredo and we were waiting for the officer, I told Arturo, hey Arturo, do you want to switch sides? Maybe you want to fly the rest uh, of the flight home? And he said, yeah, why not? So we exchanged seats and now he was flying pilot in the front seat. In the carbon cub, his pilot flies in the front and the co-pilot flies in the back, the rear. I checked the weather for, for Monterey and it was all VFR. We were just uh, flying direct 
I would say about 2,500 feet. In Monterey, a, a bit north of Monterey, about I would say about 20 miles north, there's a small hilly terrain. It's called uh, Mamulique. So when we approached this place, this uh, hilly terrain, uh, we noticed that was, there was an overcast layer above the, the hills, but there was a gap between the hills and the overcast. So we thought nothing about it, and we, which we were planning just to go above the hills in that uh, small gap of, of BFR conditions. When we got to the hilly terrain, the turbulence, I mean, was very, very hard, very, very tough turbulence. It was moving the plane from one side to another, and I got scared. And uh, I was holding on to my cell phone and to the seat, and I was trying not to, to tell him what to do. I mean, he's a pilot, and I didn't want to distract him. I mean, he had a job to do. But it got w worse. I mean, it was, we were just being hammered all over the place. And uh, I was afraid that we were going to hit the side of a, a hill. So I told him, Arturo, we might just have to climb. And he said, yeah, I think it's best. So he punched the power, pulled the, the nose up, and we started climbing. Unfortunately, what we, when we climbed, we got into uh, IMC, uh, instrument conditions. And the plane is, is VFR, so, but we didn't have a choice. Once we were, were IMC, I told him, Arturo, remember your training, your IFR rated. I know this is not an IFR plane, but just keep your heading. You know what to do. And I just thought, I, I'm not going to bug him with the details. I mean, he's a pilot. I, I don't want to uh, tell him what to do. So I was grabbing on, and the only thing I could see in front of me was his, the back of his, his head and his shoulders. I think no more than 10 or 15 seconds passed, and I was looking at the side. There's uh, two small windows. That's uh, all the all the visibility I had. And looking at my at the left window, I all of a sudden saw sky, and then ground again, and then sky again. And I said, "Oh my God, we're spiraling." And I thought, "This is it." And then I. I don't remember what happened anymore. When I woke up, I was hanging upside down inside the aircraft, and uh, I opened my eyes and I saw dirt, just gravel, some dirt and some small insects. And, but I didn't understand what was going on. So I pushed myself and I fell out of the aircraft on my back. And I was outside the aircraft looking at this. the plane was right there. And I, saw, I was looking at the sky and my mind didn't understand what was happening for the few, first few seconds. And then it hit me. I mean, we're in the ground. I mean, we were flying. What's going on? So I looked for Arturo and I couldn't see him. I, I could only see the plane and I, I, started, I started calling for him and uh, he didn't answer. So I called louder and still no answer. I could only hear the wind uh, blowing. So I decided to try to stand up, but I, I got a, a very intense pain on my leg. And when I looked down, my foot was in an awkward position. And uh, upon more, uh, a more careful inspection, I saw my, my Jeans were torn, and the bone was sticking out in the, in the front of my, my leg. Uh, and I got into this like a routine of shouting for Arturo, see if he can answer me. And I got no response. I mean, the only thing I could see was the plane embedded in the ground. And I, I knew he was in, I mean, right there in front, but uh, I couldn't move or, or I couldn't, he didn't answer. so. I didn't know what was his uh, condition at the time. I got into some kind of survival mode in which I said, okay, uh, nobody knows you're here. What's your next step? So uh, I started looking for my cell phone and uh, 
I turned <clears throat> to the right, and it was right there. Uh, incredibly, the phone was uh, not uh, broken, and it was uh, right there. I just, just picked it up, but I couldn't see because I don't, didn't have my glasses. I used uh, Siri to call my wife. So I told her that I was going to send you my, <clears throat> my coordinates, and I, I hung, up, hung up the phone. I used my phone and I sent her the, the, the GPS coordinates where I was. She told me that she got the coordinates and uh, she passed them along to my friend Francisco. Uh, and uh, I called Francisco and I told him, hey Francisco, do you know what happened? And he said, yeah, uh, your wife explained and help is on the way. I didn't know at the time that we had hit a tower in flight. There was a radio tower. We hit the tower with the right wing and it sheared the wing completely. And uh, we spiraled into the ground and we hit the ground real, real hard. The rescue took about two hours to arrive. It was very hilly terrain, very difficult terrain to, to get there. The first person who came in to, to, to arri that arrived to the scene was my friend Leopoldo. He got in his truck, got the coordinates, and just drove direct to my spot. And I was so relieved to see another person with me there. And he immediately tell, told him, please check on Arturo. He doesn't answer me. So he went and checked on, on my son. And uh, he he made a sign that, uh, like with his head, and he told me that he, I understood, understood completely that, that, uh, that I had lost him. And uh, it, it, I, I thought, I mean, a lot of things went in my, in my, my head at that moment. I didn't know what to think. Uh, it was extremely difficult. I mean, I cannot explain the feeling. I go over this uh, very often, mostly at night. I relive the accident and I look at all my, my alternatives. I mean, I can think about many things that I should have done to prevent this. I mean, we, we could just have turned back as something as simple as that. And the fact that we have traversed this terrain so many times, because that was our way out of town every time we flew, you get the feel that it's something that there's nothing to it. I mean, it's, you're, you're so used to flying there that you don't think twice about, about flying that uh, terrain the way we did. I knew that eventually one day I would go back to the accident site. I can't answer why I had the urge to go. Maybe just to some way like close a circle. I said a prayer there. I don't know if it helped or not. Only time will tell. But it's something that I think I, I needed to do. I try to keep myself busy. If I just stay still at home, the demons, the demons start coming up and bad thoughts. I go into a very dark place. So I try to keep myself busy. When I was in the hospital right after the accident, I had thought about leaving aviation altogether. Uh, aviation has been my life. I thought about what Arturo Jr. would want. So I decided to go all in. So after the accident, I got my IFR rating. And after the instrument rating, I got my commercial. It's incredible how, how talented Arturo was. I mean, he was very soft-spoken, very smart kid. I mean, not just because he was my son. I mean, he, he excelled in everything he did. When, whenever the chance came up, he always said, uh, I'm a pilot. <laughs> it made him proud. I, it felt good to have something that I could relate to and something that we could do together. I'm going to miss him a lot. He was 
He was my best friend. He was my partner. I miss him every minute of every hour of every day. One of my biggest fears is, and I know it, I know it won't happen, but one of my biggest fears is that he be forgotten. So one of my objectives of doing this is to honor him and uh, so that uh, he never he never is forgotten. <sighs> In the wake of tragedy, Arturo Guerrero Sr.'s story is a poignant reminder of the fragility of life. Through the lens of the devastating loss he experienced on November 25th, 2021, Arturo confronts the decisions that were made that day and their consequences. Their story is a sobering lesson in the dangers of complacency. In this case, complacency came in the form of comfort and familiarity with their task at hand. To get home via an often traveled route with an easy to fly airplane, reinforced by the camaraderie of a father and son who flew together frequently. In a different circumstance, the question of whether to fly through a gap between the mountains and clouds in strong winds might have been quickly dismissed. But coupled with insidious complacency and the promise of their home airport awaiting them just over the next hill, the temptation prevailed. This decision placed the two pilots in a situation with very limited options. After facing the extreme mountain turbulence and rising terrain, they felt that climbing through the clouds was their only way out. But intentional flight from visual to instrument conditions is almost never a good option, especially in turbulent conditions. As is sadly the case in most VFR into IMC scenarios, they succumb to spatial disorientation. While Arturo's healing process is marked by sorrow, and a seemingly never-ending repetition of what-ifs, he hopes his story can prevent another pilot from falling victim to the same tragedy. We can learn from this accident by understanding how to fight complacency in the cockpit. Adopting a learner's mindset is a pilot's strongest defense against the traps of overconfidence and routine, the core of complacency. Actively seeking to learn by pursuing new endorsements or ratings can disrupt the cycle of complacency before it ever begins to form. By sharing these insights, Arturo Sr. not only honors a lost aviator, but turns his personal loss into a beacon of guidance for the aviation community.